the more you read about Hitler and the more you read about the origins and formation of the Nazi party, the more you realize that Hitler was a failure over and over again in his life. So first, whether it was his inability to get into art school or his inability to make a career as an artist, then it was his inability to see Germany to a victory during World War I, and then finally his failure to successfully overthrow the government in what was called the Beer Hall Putsch that we talked about last episode. And it makes you wonder about ideas like fate and determinism, because each time that Hitler failed, it seemed like the world presented him with a new opportunity. And each time that he failed, it seems like he learned something that could be useful. Unfortunately for the rest of Germany, he learned something that could be useful and applied it for the next time. It just seemed like he got chance after chance after chance. And eventually, when you have all of the crazy things that are going on in German society at the time, when you have that perfect storm where you're ripe for a possible fringe party to take over, eventually, if you keep giving them enough chances, something bad is going to happen. This is exactly what would happen at the end of 1923 after Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch. So let's make no mistake about it. This was a armed overthrow attempt by Hitler and the Nazi party trying to overthrow the legitimately elected government of Germany. That's a fancy way to say this was treason of the highest order. Most countries, most governments, most people probably wouldn't hesitate for a second to inflict the strictest of punishments on guys like Hitler and Goring and Ludendorff who organized this armed overthrow of the government. But instead of maybe the capital punishment or life in jail or many, many years in prison, almost all of the top-level guys got off with very light sentences. Hitler was sentenced to five years in jail, and ultimately he only served less than a year of that. Ludendorff, amazingly, got completely acquitted. Listen to the reasoning of the court here when they decided to acquit Ludendorff. They're talking about the participants in the armed rebellion. Quote, they were led in their action by a pure patriotic spirit and the most noble will. End quote. So they were led to commit treason by the fact that they were so patriotic and so spirited in their attempt. And because of this patriotism that led them to commit treason, they were now going to be acquitted. That was the logic of these courts, and it underscores the fact that a lot of these courts were tremendously corrupt. So whether it was right wing or left wing, mostly right wing at this time, you had a level of corruption throughout the courts that continued to let these Nazi criminals get back into society. We talked about Hitler and Ludendorff essentially you know, paying a very small penalty and then re-entering society, but all sorts of political prisoners at the time would often get out of jail pretty much for free, with little to no sentences. And the reason for this was because the parliamentary deals that were going on at the time between the far left and the far right. Both sides wanted their people out of jail, and a lot of times these types of crimes were seen as lesser crimes because, again, they were politically motivated. These people had, you know, quote-unquote, patriotic wills. And this was seen as kind of a lesser crime if you maybe beat someone up because of their politics than if you, say, beat someone up because of you're trying to steal their stuff. And a lot of times these two sides would make deals. Hey, you know, you, you release those prisoners, we'll release these prisoners. And then all of a sudden you just have this recycling system of, you know, people going out, committing violence, beating people up, killing people, and then getting released back into society and then doing the exact same thing. So this phenomenon was clearly a joke and it led to a lot more increased violence because 
Now all of a sudden, more and more of these thugs are walking around on the streets. It led to very small penalties for guys like Hitler who could literally attempt to overthrow the government and then barely face a year in prison. And it also led to increased polarization among different parties because those people are now back out on the street, they're fighting again, and every time a new incident happens, people are getting more and more entrenched in their own views. It is my opinion that this opportunity that Hitler got to get chance after chance after chance and the philosophy of allowing political prisoners to essentially kind of get away with things and do what they want, this allowed Hitler to eventually figure everything out and get the ball rolling towards taking over Germany. spending his time in jail, which by the way was a relatively comfortable jail with furnishings and visitors being allowed to come in whenever they wanted and a nice view of the outside world. He spent a lot of time reading up on different philosophers such as Nietzsche and Spengler and mostly he was just looking and picking them apart for any sort of confirmation that he could find that he could use to kind of mold into his philosophy. So he kind of had his own personal platform of the Nazi party, and he was kind of just looking through some other philosophers' stuff to see if he could take anything from them, even if it was cherry-picked and completely inaccurate, and put it in with his own work. Ultimately, he would kind of put all of this together, and he would write a book called Mein Kampf, and this means my struggle. So in the book, he talks a lot about his anti-Semitism and some of his philosophies, but it's also vague and somewhat difficult to read. This book was not by any stretch of the imagination a bestseller or anything like that. Obviously, it became much more popular once Hitler was fully entrenched in power and it was almost forced that you had to have a copy in your house. But at this point, no one really read it, but the book was out there. Anyone who wanted to read up on some of Hitler's more extreme or racist philosophies had full access to do that. While he was in jail, there was a bit of a power struggle inside of the Nazi party, which Hitler was trying to deal with, and ultimately he did deal with it successfully. Ludendorff and Hitler butted heads over who was going to become the figurehead for the far right wing of German society. Ludendorff actually ran for president on a far right wing platform, only getting about 1% of the vote. And after that, Ludendorff kind of went away and kind of that was the end of him from a political sense after that. It was said that Hitler actually wanted Ludendorff to do that because he knew he wouldn't win. And once he kind of lost that humiliating presidential run, now Hitler had full control over everyone on the right, or at least the far right, I should say. It was at this time that a man named Joseph Goebbels came over to the Nazi cause He was very much impressed by Hitler. He called Hitler, quote, I love you because you are both great and simple at the same time, what one calls a genius, end quote. So the criteria for Joseph Goebbels to be a genius, obviously not very stringent, but anyway, he also said of Hitler, quote, half plebeian, half God, end quote. And he was impressed by his big blue eyes like stars. Goebbels would later become an important piece of the Nazi propaganda machine and an important influence on Hitler as far as changing the direction of the party. In the 1928 parliamentary elections, the Nazi party only won 2.6% of the vote, and Hitler and Goebbels and Goring and the Nazi higher-ups suddenly realized that they needed a change of strategy. Part of this came from the failed Beer Hall Putsch attempt as well, but the basic idea is that Hitler thought, no longer can I do it with violence alone. So I'm not just going to be able to pull a Mussolini and just march down the streets and violently take over the government. That's not going to work here in Germany. What Hitler and his Nazi cohorts decide on is a much more sophisticated and efficient propaganda machine. So they really started unleashing Hitler in particular to give enthusiastic speeches and he would fly all over the country and give speeches to a variety of different peoples. 
we're talking about massive halls that are filled to the brim, and he's getting everybody excited about the movement. We're also talking about books, essays, editorials, posters, pamphlets, anything the Nazis could do to get their message into the hands of people, they would do. Again, Hitler kept the propaganda message very simple. So he used short, easy-to-digest slogans. He had quick ideas that were simple and emotional as opposed to logical. And he attempted to appeal to everybody. He intentionally ran a platform that was vague. So he didn't have any really concrete plans about how to make the Weimar Republic or Germany as a whole a better place. He was kind of just railing on the problems with the Weimar Republic. So the more vague and general he kept it, the more he was able to appeal to a bunch of different types of people. So he would appeal to farmers, women's groups, Hitler youth, veterans groups, trade unions, even some socialists. And it obviously wasn't everybody who joined the Nazi party, but the people who did join were extremely energetic about it. I mean, there were women's groups going out there and actively promoting the... Hitlerian view of a woman's place is in the household and kind of that irony of a woman's group going out and protesting and stuff like that for a lesser role for women in society. Strange. Goebbels and the propaganda machine were not above making tragedies into political maneuver. So there's one story of a person who was killed by a communist thug, basically, Apparently that person was a member of the Nazi party, so Goebbels and Hitler rolled out the propaganda machine, they had this huge funeral, and they had all sorts of religious connotations to the thing about the person sacrificing their lives for the cause, and all of this, and how, look at these horrible communists who are willing to use violence, and they're ruining our society, etc., etc. They were chanting, uh, stormtroopers during the funeral were singing verses of a song, uh, one verse, quote, Together with us, marching in our ranks in spirit, are those comrades red front and reaction shot dead. End quote. The irony of a nonviolent protest singing a song about how they're going to kill all the communists is lost on many of the Nazi supporters. Hitler and Goebbels would do this all the time, and they showed an absolute willingness to pander to everyone and everything in order to get power. And of course, all of this propaganda and enthusiasm is undercut by a violence and a street-level thuggery that's going on with Nazi brown shirts and SA members and Hitler youth going around beating people up, uh, committing political crimes, and just contributing to this atmosphere of polarization and chaos that was going on during the Weimar Republic. Just as the Nazis are re-strategizing and reformulating their game plan and having a lot of success with it, in particular this new propaganda campaign, they get aided by one of the worst events in the 20th century, the Great Depression. On October 29th, 1929, the New York Stock Exchange crashed, and it's known as Black Tuesday. Here's historian Richard J. Evans talking about the stock exchange crash, and the impact on Germany of the Great Depression, quote, But these dramatic days of disaster were only the most visible aspects of what turned out to be a prolonged and seemingly an inexorable decline over the next three years. The New York Times index fell from a high of 452 points in September 1929 to 58 points by July 1932. On October 29th, $10 billion were wiped off the value of the major American companies, twice the amount of all money in circulation in the United States at the time, and almost as much as America had spent on financing its part in the Great War. Company after company went bust. American demand for imports collapsed. Banks plunged into crisis as their investments disappeared. And as American banks saw their losses mount, they started calling in the short-term loans with which so much of German industry had been financing itself for the past five years. End quote. So American and International banks are now calling in loans on Germany. The economy is becoming more and more unstable due to this. There's less capital available for investment, less capital available for companies to uh, invest, create, produce. And this leads to, of course, cutbacks, unemployment, inflation, 
and you combine this with the already unstable economy in Germany, in large part due to those reparations that were still being paid off, and boom, you have the recipe for complete economic disaster, which is what happens in Germany after 1929. In 1932, more than 13 million people in German society were unemployed. That's more than 20% of the population, and that is, you don't even have to say it, that's a huge issue. That's a huge crisis. And it was actually probably more than 20% because a lot of times women usually didn't register as unemployed or they weren't counted. So when you factor them in, that number, some people think, goes as high as 30%. The benefits and welfare system completely collapses, as we talked about in the last episode. This, of course, leads to resentment towards the stable, you know, Social Democratic Party, the leading cohorts in Parliament. The Communist Party sees a bunch of gains because usually the Communist Party is the party of the unemployed. And all of a sudden, communism is seen as a rising threat. It's seen that perhaps this could be a Soviet Germany sooner or later. And of course, this unleashes a newer round of street violence between communists and brown shirts, left extremists and right extremists. Again, one historian called that quasi guerrilla warfare. And all the while, the Nazis are slowly taking people in that are dissatisfied with whatever party they came from. We have this rising communist threat, so a lot of times the reaction is worse than the initial problem, and a lot of people go over to the Nazi party as a result. With the economy in complete disaster mode and society on the brink of collapse, in 1930, the Grand Coalition government essentially resigns in disgrace. So this is the parliamentary kind of head honchos who are in charge. They resign in disgrace. Now, the leader of the executive branch is President Hindenburg. So Hindenburg was a former World War I general, and he's a known authoritarian and essentially an enemy of the Republic. He's going to nominate a guy by the name of Heinrich Brüning to be the chancellor, the leader of the parliamentary section of government. And both men essentially sought the government to be more authoritarian. They wanted a decrease in the power of the Reichstag or the parliament. They wanted a decrease in civil liberties. And they wanted to crack down on some of the press and journalistic aspects of Weimar society. Neither man was really confident in the parliamentary system of government that the Weimar Republic was currently operating under. So with Bruning now in charge of the legislature, he goes on a mission to try and fix the economy, which is failing during the Great Depression, and ultimately his plan just fails and ultimately just ticks everybody off. So the far left, the far right, the left, the right, the center, everybody's upset with this guy, and he's probably the most unpopular leader in Europe at the time. Bruning wants to cut government expenses mainly is the main way to try and fix the economy. He thinks that Germany is spending too much on welfare, things like that. And of course, the Social Democrats are going to oppose him because that's essentially their platform. And neither side can get anything done. And Bruning decides he's going to dissolve parliament. So if there's enough chaos and if enough people agree to it, you can dissolve parliament and call for new elections. So he thought that people would kind of support him. The Social Democrats said, hey, maybe people will support us. And in 1930, there's a new parliamentary election as a result. The biggest surprise of the 1930 election was just how well the Nazi party did. So that reformation and that reorganization that Hitler did after the Beer Hall Putsch now is starting to reap the benefits. The Nazis won 6.7 million votes, which equals 107 Reichstag seats, and this was a huge surprise to everybody. The Nazis did well among first-time voters. They did well amongst old voters who switched from the Nationalist Party over to the Nazi Party, and their bread and butter was the lower middle class. Ultimately, the Nazis were the protest party. People were sick of a sick and ailing Germany. The Nazis offered a strong and decisive message of strength and unity, while also being vague enough to appeal to a lot of different groups. So I can't really emphasize how difficult that is to do on the political scene. Being able to show a message of strength and unity 
while also criticizing the government intensely and also appealing to a lot of different groups, that's difficult to do. Ultimately, people saw what they wanted to see in the Nazis, and they ignored what they didn't want to see, which, sadly, was quite a bit. As the Nazis were doing better and better at the election polls, perhaps not surprisingly, the amount of violence and just chaos that was going on in society was also increasing. Listen to this description of one of the fights, basically, the brawls that happens at one of these Nazi rallies that Hermann Goring is in charge of. Quote, A terrifying melee followed. Blackjacks, brass knuckles, clubs, heavily buckled belts, glasses, and bottles were the weapons used. Pieces of glass and chairs hurtled over the heads of the audience. Men from both sides broke off chair legs and used them as bludgeons. Women fainted in the crash and scream of battle. Already dozens of heads and faces were bleeding. Clothes were torn as the fighters dodged amid masses of terrified but helpless spectators. The troopers fought like lions. Systematically, they pressed us towards the main exit. The band struck up a martial tune. Hermann Goring stood calmly on the stage, his fists on his hips. End quote. I mean, that sounds like a scene from Westworld. I mean, this isn't HBO. This is real Germany, and you have this level of violence going on all the time. The police force was decentralized and ineffective, and many of the police were actually limited as far as their loyalty to the Weimar Republic. Many of the police officers were actually ex-soldiers, and many of these ex-soldiers had kind of ties with the right wing, and sometimes they sympathized with the brown shirts, and sometimes they sympathized with the Nazi paramilitaries, because many of those paramilitary guys were former ex-veterans, and there was kind of this bond between the police and them, and the point is, ultimately, the police were not an effective tool that the Weimar Republic could use to curb violence. By 1931, society was in complete chaos, and Parliament actually was also in complete chaos. So the Parliament, the Reichstag, had completely devolved into shouting matches between Nazis on one side, communists on the other side, and essentially nothing got done in Parliament. So the country was being run by President Hindenburg and his cronies, essentially. But there's a problem. In 1932, there's a presidential election, and Hindenburg's planning on running. The other person who's planning on running is Adolf Hitler. These seem to be the two most popular guys, and it's probably going to come down to those two. And we know that Hindenburg has a authoritarian streak, and he's against, essentially, a parliamentary government. He wants to figure out a way to go back to the old Kaiser and the old Bismarckian system that we talked about in the first episode. And then there's Hitler, who is right of right. So now all of a sudden, if you are the Social Democrats, or if you're the Communists, or if you're any of the moderate parties, who are you backing here? Are you going to back Hindenburg, a stated enemy of democracy? Or are you going to back Hitler, a clear and violent enemy of everybody. So amazingly, the Social Democrats and the more moderate parties throw their weight behind Hindenburg. Again, a stated enemy of their... This is what it's come to, is that the moderate parties are now throwing their weight behind a stated enemy of democracy. And they throw their weight behind Hindenburg. Hindenburg wins barely, um, but he's barely able to get a majority. So... I think it was only 53%, but it wasn't exactly a decisive victory. The chaos would continue. The Chancellor Bruning would resign, and Hindenburg would put his own guy, a guy by the name of Papen, in there, and they would try to establish a conservative Bismarck style of government. But in order to do this, in order to get rid of the you know parliamentary system, they needed Hitler and they needed the majority in parliament that Hitler would soon have. So in the 1932 parliamentary elections, 13.1 million people voted for the Nazi party. That's 230 seats in the parliament, and while it's not a full majority, it is more than any other party had. So Hitler and the Nazis now essentially controlled parliament. They got 37.4% of the vote as far as people who actually voted. So it was not, again, not a majority, but more than any other party. Where did these votes come from? 
a lot more came from, again, the lower middle class. The propaganda campaigns were working. They got a lot more votes from splinter parties and 25% of new voters also voted for the Nazi party. And a lot of people just jumped ship seeing the chaos that was going on and seeing the strength that the Nazi party was providing. They were jumping ship from even the social Democrats. So the Nazis kind of picked people from a lot of different parties and kind of brought them into their own Nazi program. With the Nazis in control of Parliament and Hindenburg and Papen still in control of the presidency and the chancellorship, the time for the destruction of the Republic had arrived. So Hindenburg wanted to just get rid of it, and so did Papen. But in order to do this, they needed Hitler and the Nazis to play ball. So Hitler actively refused to do anything with Hindenburg or anything with Papen because he wanted to be named either president or chancellor so that he could run the show by himself. And just to underscore the chaos here, we are very close to a civil war at this point, perhaps between the Nazis and the communists or perhaps between the communists and the social democrats and the Nazis. There was a rumor that the Reichsbanner, this was the paramilitary group of the social democrats, had assembled, you know, thousands and thousands of people and they were going to attempt a coup, but ultimately it never happened. So that's one of the great what ifs of this story is what if that paramilitary group had attempted a coup for the social democrats because who knows where things might have gone from there. But ultimately it didn't happen because it went against the principles of the social democratic party to, you know, violently remove a government that was legitimately elected. I bet if you could ask them 10 years later, they probably would have done it. A fresh round of elections at the end of 1932 doesn't go Papin's way. And again, he's forced to resign in disgrace. There's chaos and destruction everywhere. And President Hindenburg essentially reluctantly gives the chancellor position to Adolf Hitler, who now seems to have the support of the people and who seems to have the support of the army. By the beginning of 1933, you have a majority of the parliament, more than 50%, under the control of anti-democratic parties, whether that be the Nazi parties or other far-right parties or the Communist Party. And you had Adolf Hitler, who was clearly against democracy, as the chancellor. And you had President Hindenburg, who is a stated enemy, again, of democracy, as the president. So by 1933, that's pretty much the end of the Weimar Republic. Hitler would now be the most powerful man in Germany, but he still did have a long way to go before he consolidated and had enough support to take Germany on the destructive path that he wanted to take it. To sum things up, exactly how did the Nazis come to power in an official capacity? In the end, I think the people of Germany were tired. They were tired of the violence. They were tired of the guilt from World War I. They were tired of the horrible economic conditions. They were tired of the gangs of thugs roaming the streets, killing people, beating people up. They were tired of a welfare system that didn't work and a parliamentary government that was all but useless. They were tired of political hatred and squabbling between parties. They were tired of a parliament that couldn't even get routine issues completed. And in their fatigue, about 37% of the voting bloc turned to a man and a party that, even though his beliefs were obvious and plain to see, they probably didn't fully understand. With the benefit of hindsight, us sitting here in the future in 2017 understand what Hitler was about and the devastation and the destruction and everything that his ideology caused and would cause. But unfortunately for the people of Germany, and really the people of the world, hindsight is 2020. Coming up on the next episode... Hitler is now the most popular man in Germany. He's also the most powerful man in Germany. 
but he's still a few steps away from consolidating power and truly turning the German government into the totalitarian Nazi regime that we all know and despise. So Hitler finalizing and solidifying his horrifying regime will be the next episode. As always, thanks for listening. If you want to support the podcast at all, you can leave a rating or review on iTunes or whatever platform you want. You can also tell a friend, talk about the podcast, spread the word that way, subscribe, like, etc. So if you want to do that, you can. Otherwise, I will see you next time.